Before heading out at 6.30 a.m., Tammy checks in on her 13-year-old daughter, Nicole Lovell. When I went to her room, I noticed that her nightstand was up against her door. So I kind of pushed it. The whole room was cold, and her window was open. Nicole wasn't there. I was scared. I didn't know where she was. Nothing's ever happened like this before, ever. I noticed the only thing that was missing was her cell phone and her blanket. Her favorite blanket was the menu blanket. She'd take that everywhere with her. I knew something was wrong. Tammy soon notices something else alarming. I went to see if she had took any of her liver medicine and she hadn't took any. And that was really bad. She would get sick quick without her medicine, and then it would get fatal. So during the investigation, law enforcement was going through Nicole's digital footprint, going through her social media. What was being found indicated that Nicole was pretty much a typical 13-year-old girl. She hung out with her friends and went to the mall. She you know, wanted a boyfriend, but also she had her insecurities. She was perhaps a little bit depressed. She was down on herself. One of her friends had stated that Nicole was supposed to have a essentially a secret date that night. That was very concerning and certainly increased the likelihood that there was foul play involved in her disappearance. One of the things Nicole's friends confided on is that she did have relationships with older boys on some of the numerous social applications that she was using, including somebody that she was referring to as a boyfriend. He was interacting with Nicole online. Other than that, her friends didn't have a lot of information about her. It was learned that Nicole's last communication was with an individual who had the username of Dr. Tombstone. They learned that Dr. Tombstone belonged to someone by the name of David Eisenhower. David Eisenhower, we learned, was an 18-year-old freshman at Virginia Tech. Law enforcement tracked down David Eisenhower. At the beginning of the interview, I told him why we were there that Nicole Lovell was missing, and we felt like he could help us with the investigation. Mid-December, if I remember correctly, I was bored in my dorm room and logged on to a website where you go and you just talk to random strangers. It's an anonymous kind of, the website is called Omegle, if I believe correctly. Okay. And then she's like, hey, do you want to use my, or like, message me on some app called Kick, and I was like, sure, whatever. David claims that at the time, he didn't know Nicole was only 13. We're talking, and she's like, yeah, I'm 16 or 17. I do not remember the age, she said. He also says that he arranged to pick Nicole up at her place and meet her for the first time on the night she disappeared. I get there, and then I see someone who probably looked like she was 11 years old climb out of a window, and I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh, not for me. And then he said, at that point, I immediately drove back to campus, and I went to talk to a friend. I was like, hey, can I come by your dorm room, please? David describes himself as immediately walking away, and yet he went to meet this girl, and she's disappeared. It can't be that simple. I'd stop you there, because mm -hmm. I feel like we're getting sideways. At that point in the interview is where we challenged him. This young lady's never been heard from again, OK? Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be possible for us to believe that account of events. OK. At first, David's reaction is to deny having any more knowledge. I told you, I do not know where she is. He was adamant when he left Nicole's apartment. That was the, the last that he knew about it. And then he made a very unusual comment. I think the police should look more into finding a body than try to interrogate the last person who saw her alive, who clearly left the scene. David says that we should be out looking for a body instead of talking to him. At that point, David became a suspect. 
it was determined that David would be detained pending further investigation. Oh. David Eisenhower, stand up and put your hands behind your back. You are under arrest for the abduction of Nicole Madison Lovell. Early in the interview, he said that uh, after he walked away from Nicole, that he'd gone to see a friend. I was like, hey, can I come to by your dorm room, please? Can I, just like I asked him who this friend was, and that's when he identified Natalie Keepers, who was another Virginia Tech student. When we located Natalie, she willingly went with us to the police department. She was cooperative. She actually gave us permission to look at her phone. She admits knowing David Eisenhower and actually spoke very highly of him. I mean, okay. David, he's a really sweet guy. He's like my best friend. Now, throughout this time, information from Natalie and David's phone is being downloaded. Law enforcement is going through it. They find text messages between David and Natalie. In particular, there were text messages between David and Natalie talking about cleaning up blood, talking about the smell of blood. They're talking about trying to cover up a crime scene. She is confronted with their text messages. We know that you have information about this. What do you think they're falling out of your phone? And Natalie caves. She was okay, where is she? According to Natalie, David had killed Nicole. Natalie, how much are you involved in this? Well, he to forced me to move to help him move her body. Over the next several hours, Natalie reveals the chilling details of what she claims happened to Nicole Lovell. And that was all Natalie was saying that Nicole wanted to start a relationship and David really wanted nothing to do with her. He was getting nervous that Nicole would somehow expose him for having, having sex with her. So David felt that he needed to get rid of her. Yeah. It also turns out that Natalie was a very big part of the homicide. On the night that Nicole Lovell went missing, Natalie said she and David went to a fast food restaurant to finalize the plan. They then drove to pick out a spot for David to kill Nicole. The plan was to take her to a secluded location to almost make it like a date. And then he stabbed her. He killed her in the in the woods. The next day, he told me that he needed help. We went to Walmart. We got baby wipes and bleach. And she was in the trunk. And then he drove. Natalie claims that while Nicole was killed less than 10 miles from the Virginia Tech campus, they hit her body nearly 100 miles away. Nicole was located off the main road going off the side of a mountain. She was stabbed a number of times. She was not buried. They apparently had just tossed her from the edge. No murder weapon is found at the scene. But with the recovery of Nicole's body, David is now charged with first-degree murder. Natalie Keepers is also charged with concealing a body, as well as being an accessory before the fact to first-degree murder. The two will be tried separately. David will face a jury first. The defense insists that the blame actually lies with the other suspect in the case, David's friend, Natalie Keepers. They were going to try and show that David did not kill Nicole. It was Natalie that killed Nicole. They argued that the idea to commit a murder, she thought it was exciting. That really, Natalie was kind of the, the mastermind behind all of this. It appears David even tried to scare Nicole into keeping silent about his relationship with her because she was underage. There were threatening text messages to Nicole saying, don't tell anybody about me or else they will hurt you. 
There were also text messages that were found on the phone of David and found on the phone of Natalie. They are talking about hiding evidence in a number of different places. This included the murder weapon, which has never been found. They got rid of the knife somewhere off of Interstate I-81 in Virginia. By the fourth day of testimony, the state's case against David seems insurmountable. And then the defense had a twist we didn't anticipate. David changed his plea to no contest. A no contest plea really means that I'm not saying I did it, but I'm not going to challenge any of the evidence. I think he realized ultimately that he had no defense. The evidence against him was overwhelming. By pleading no contest, David likely avoided the life sentence he risked if convicted by a jury. He's ordered to serve 50 years behind bars, followed by 20 years of probation. Two and a half years after the murder of Nicole Lovell, Natalie Keeper's trial gets underway. Prosecutors present the jury with their most damning evidence, the statements of Natalie herself. In that interview, she said she got excited by being involved in this. He made me feel like, I was being a part of some, like, secret club that, like, only me and him were a part of. It was never really clear if David and Natalie had something romantic. But you could see that Natalie was in awe of David. We also were able to find evidence in her dorm room, including Nicole's minion blanket. While Natalie herself doesn't testify, Witnesses for the defense attack the credibility of her so-called confession. They include an expert on police interrogation. Their theory was you had a fairly young, inexperienced defendant, and these experienced police officers had caused her to falsely confess to things. But the hallmark of a false confession case is that there is no corroboration. Everything Natalie mentioned doing was corroborated by some piece of evidence. You never know what a jury's gonna do. In this case, the jury came back very quickly, less than an hour and 15 minutes after they had gone out. They found Natalie Keepers guilty of being an accessory before the fact to the murder of Nicole Lowe. Natalie is sentenced to 40 years in prison and 10 years of probation for her role in the murder. <laughs>